in his kingdom. How many are here? That is our purpose. Tonight I want to speak to you kind of on the why. But my, my, the subject that came to my mind is the process of purification. The process of purification. If you'll turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. I cheated. I already have my my scriptures all tabbed. (laughs) All right, I I don't hear any more pages being turned. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Really really just a few, it's a real short uh, letter to the Colossia and uh, from from, uh, Apostle Paul. And in verse 10 he says, And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, without hands, in putting off the body of the sins. You're taking the sins away from the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Let's all be seated. Tonight I want to talk to you, I want to start with something. Uh, now, I, I, I'm a, an engineer by trade, so uh, everything to me is process related. I'm a little on the analytical side to the point of almost being very boring, so... I just try to internalize all that stuff and not talk about it too much. But tonight, it just came out to me. This, God was talking to me about some things, and he wanted me to just share this with you about processes. There's a lot of different types of processes. Uh, one of my favorite types of processes is making coffee. How many of y'all do this process in the morning to get your day going? Yes, there's a process. you got a little routine that you go through. How about uh, driving through the city? Thank goodness there's a process to drive across the city because there's stop signs and there's lines in the road that tells you what side of the road to drive on. There's all kinds of little processes. Uh, something that made me think, you know, when you go to the hospital, Dr. Ruth, and you, you tend to a patient, there's a process that the way you go through your, your day. And Sister Hannah, when you teach your children the curriculum, that curriculum is a process to get them to learn what they need to do by the end of the year. Even preparing a meal. Ladies, when you're cook at home cooking your meal, that's a process. And men, when you're at home doing the laundry, yeah, it's okay, wives, y'all can thank me later. There's a process. The list goes on and on. There's a specific process I want to talk about today. This is actually the, the process of purification. Uh, this is something that I used to do years ago, and I've done it within different uh, companies that I work with, is we would build and fabricate plants that produce or purify different products, whether it's gasoline or crude oil, which is you start with crude oil. That's where you get gasoline, diesel, all these other products, uh, plastics, all, most of the clothes you wear. It all comes from crude oil. That was free. Um, but this particular process was that I, the Lord brought on my heart was carbon dioxide. How many are familiar with what carbon dioxide is? I know Brother Jack is because he and I used to build them. I'd draw pictures of them, and he would actually make it work. He was, remember those sail-off days, brother? Yes. You still have nightmares about them? Me too. Me too, brother. Uh, But the process of purification uh, begins uh, with understanding what the use is. You, if you're gonna if you're gonna purify something, it's got to have a purpose, right? If you're gonna do something, it's it's got to be useful for something. Or if you're just you're just wasting money and wasting energy and wasting time. So the 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 purpose of the carbonation. To put in, let's say, soda, uh, your Dr. Pepper, 
or your big red. Hallelujah. Or your Mountain Dew. And how about some amen for some Topo Chico? You got to have a little carbon dioxide in there. That carbonization helps preserve the contents. And it's usually just sugar and water and caffeine and some flavoring. But the CO2 keeps it from growing organisms. Because bacteria needs oxygen to grow, the CO2 displaces the oxygen in the bottle. So let's look at the little short. I, mean, I did a real high level. I'm not going to drill into it, so I don't want to see anybody falling asleep because this is going to be short. I kept it real short. So to begin with this process, before you can purify gas, you've got to have a source. You've got to have something to source it. So a lot of times they'll get a, something that's off of some type of system that creates a lot of extra CO2. So they, they take and they put a blower on that source to draw the gas into the process. Okay, and then to, when they take that source gas, it's usually saturated with a lot of water and a lot of other stuff, just innumerable. There's just all kinds of elements in this, this system. It's just saturated with all kinds of contaminants. Well, they lower the temperature of this gas, and this gas, all of a sudden, it starts condensing, Kind of like when you pour a nice big glass of cold sweet tea outside in the summertime and the water starts beading up on the outside of the glass and you know, oh, this is going to be good. That's called condensation. So that happens on the inside of the system. That water drops out and it removes a large quantity and a large portion of those impurities and allows the gas to continue on. So you remove a lot of the, and the majority of the, of the contaminants in the water, you move it out of the way, you pump it out, and then it gets to a point where it gets into compression. Now, you've got a source, it's a real, it's kind of, it's kind of there, it's not quite there, but it's too low of a pressure to be able to do anything with it, so you need to increase the pressure in the system, so you need a compressor. So we've got these really huge, giant compressors that take five or 600 horsepower to, to spin them up, real big motors, aren't they, Jack? They were... Uh, Real heavy, real hard to get straight because they were so big. But you had to make them perfectly in line so they would work correctly. But the pressure increase would also cause it to have a temperature increase. And so this product, to be able to, I, I'm going to skip all the rest of the process. So I'm just going to stop it there. So you're welcome. So this process needs to be make the CO2, it has to be 99.9% .9 pure for the compounds to be either reduced or completely removed so that it doesn't cause a bad taste or a bad smell. How many of you would like to open up your Dr. Pepper and it not smell like Dr. Pepper? It would smell more like somebody's dirty socks. That's not cool. Because sulfur is one of the, those components, and it does cause a very horrible odor. And so this, it also, without the purity, it would also be considered a safety risk and uh, would not be able to qualify for the uh, standards that the government puts on. Well, tonight, God desires us to understand a little bit more about the process. Please don't, don't think that I'm trying to compare you to carbon dioxide. Even though you're a carbon unit and you're made out of carbon, that's not what I'm trying to say. Let's, let's not go down that tangent. I want us to just focus on the concept of the process. So to be able to purify this, there's a, um, uh, a definition of word I want to I bring to you, and it's, it's from our scripture text, and it's understanding what circumcision is. I know a lot of you wish that I wouldn't talk about this because this would have been a good night for Kids Church, so you guys are going to have a lot of interesting questions when you get home. But tonight, we want to understand that it's, it's, it's just to remove a portion of the flesh. In the, in the Old Testament, it was meant to demonstrate separation from our carnal desires and to be truly consecrated to God as part of of the covenant with God. Abraham 
Abraham had this covenant with God, and, and he had to keep that covenant. And so he had, this was established so many years back, it was, it was just not even questioned. And the covenant was, was actually, if you want to read it in your own time, uh, Genesis chapter 17, the removal of the flesh was a token of the covenant between God and man. It was a signal, a beacon, some evidence or an outward mark and an indicator that the male, the head of the household, uh, was indeed part of the covenant with God, the Almighty God. And so when we look at some of the definitions of this, uh, it actually brings it out. It's uh, the rite of circumcision. The man was separated from the unclean world and dedicated to God. If something is unclean, it's impure. It's contaminated. And we look, and it, and, uh, but over time, as the Israelites, through time, had grown more and more religious, this turned into less of a token and more of a tradition because it, it, doesn't, it didn't carry the same meaning because it was, it was more of an identifier of being Jewish. I, I am Jews, so therefore I am, I am holier than everybody else. And I, they had already set it up as just an indicator in their society, in their culture. It had become more cultural. They had set it aside as, you know, it's not necessarily about how we dress. It is important how we dress. But that's not what identifies us as children of God. It's important that the outside reflect what's going on on the inside, right? But this is not what identifies us. This does not make us holy. This is a token of what's on the outside is reflecting on what's on the inside of us. Well, the children of Israel, they, uh, they, they kind of got this all skewed. And so Paul, in the New Testament, we jump all the way to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Colossae was... Uh, a, a, a portion of land, it's kind of, you can find it today. It's actually a, a, a city in western Turkey. It's actually completely gone. It's just some remnants of stone and things left on the, the people, you can go visit there, but there's, there's nobody, that, nobody that lives there anymore. So the Colossians that he was writing to, you can imagine, was probably a small group of people. And they raised wool. They were, they were sheep herders. They had a, an industry that, that did the wool and some of the research that I looked at. So it was really interesting that these are probably just salt of the earth people. But Paul was writing to them in chapter 2, verse 10, and he said, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, I, I, I would really implore you to just, now, I do this on the way to work. Who was it was talking about that short prayer on the way to work? I can't remember. It's like, it, it, it's not enough. But instead of listening to the radio, I cue up the Bible, and I got the little app that reads to you. So I just saturate myself with the Word so I'm not listening to other voices. And so I started listening from Romans and just let it go. 
And so what I was starting to do is I'm actually starting to understand what Paul is doing, not just reading a scripture or two or a passage or a chapter, but I'm actually getting a kind of a, 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 an overall theme of what he's trying to do. He's trying to explain to all these churches in Rome and Colossia and, and Thessalonica and Philippi and all these different places, he's trying to explain to them that it's, there's, there's a process to living for God. And understand that there's a big, there was big controversy too. There was a big controversy about the circumcision and being Jewish and they, they, whether it was necessary or not to be saved. And, and Peter tried to deal with it and Paul dealt with it. And here he speaks to the purpose of it. And it's like without, it just means the, the without hands, it just means that. It was, it's God-given. It's not something that you're going to do with man's hands. It's not artificial, and it's not manufactured. Now, in the New Testament, the, the covenant token was no longer administered by the hand of man, but, and no longer is the token necessary only once at birth. But the separation of the flesh is a continuous process. Because in the Old Testament, you just did it once, and you're you're done. And I think there's a lot of Christians today that think that they, they baptize in Jesus' name, you got the Holy Ghost, you spoke in tongues, you, you're, you're, doing your, you're coming to church, you're dressed right, you're walking right, you're, you're spitting white, and everything is hunky-dory. But God's saying, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. And I, I kept reading, and it just kind of jumped out at me at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, well, maybe 7. Colossians chapter, and it's really easy to find because if you held your finger right on the Bible where you were, you're in good shape. If you close your Bible, you don't have to start all over. All right, so uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 7. In the, in, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye have put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You put off. These are some things that you no longer allow to come out of your mouth out of your spirit. But if you go a couple of scriptures up, he's talking about the bad stuff. He's talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, fornication, uncleanliness, and inordinate affection, and evil concupiscence. I have to slow down to say that one. And covetousness and idolatry. There's some of us don't wrestle with those things. That's not a, that's not a temptation to me. I have no desire to go out and kill anybody or steal anything. I don't wrestle with those things. But the other things, that rings my bell. Because now I've got to look and I was like, wait a minute. I'm str I struggle with anger. I struggle with those little things because those are the little pieces of flesh that are hidden on the inside of me that need to come out. So we take those things off. And sometimes we don't even know they're there. And I want you to understand that when you are obedient to the written word of God, you repent of your sins in the obedience of the word of God. You are born of the water through baptism in Jesus' name and the remission of your sins and born of the spirit when you speak in an unknown tongue to receive the evidence of being filled with the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. That's the beginning of your covenant. That's the beginning of your circumcision made without hands. Now you're stepping into a world that's like, wait a minute, this was, I'm not done. I'm just getting started. I'm just beginning. And so Paul is trying to tell these people in Colossians that this is, this is what you have to do. You got to keep going. You got to stay in the process. 
He said, this is, this, is what the pro- this is where the process begins. You're not made perfect. We all know we're not perfect. My wife thinks I'm perfect, but I keep convincing her I'm not perfect. I love you. I know she's watching at some point. But uh, God begins this process to perfect you. Perfection is something you're continuously trying to do. You're, a, you're, you're continually attempting to be perfect. You're trying to make sure that you're striving for perfection, not that you're ever going to actually get there. That's faith. That's faith. So that, that you can be part of his kingdom. How many of you want to be part of his kingdom? This is the earnest of your inheritance. This is why you strive every day. That's why you're here today. That's why we're in revival. We want to be renewed, regenerated, uh, just refreshed. Paul was trying to explain to his churches that that they they, they can understand that there is a process and the circumcision is made without hands. And, in, and what I was saying earlier, in each one of these epistles, he's describing this. And if you just got to read the whole, the whole book. Don't just read a chapter. You got to read the whole thing. Uh, Colossians is easy. It's just a few chapters. But let's look. Let's examine what happens. There is a reason why the separation process is critical. And it really starts to impact us here today. Before God can use this church, and before he can use his body, this body of this church body has to be prepared. It has to be sanctified and holy, purified. There must be a separation of the flesh. And, and the scripture that came back to me is really the scripture that where this all started, where I started really, God started talking to me about it, was in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 2. Before there was a time to gather the people to walk around Jericho, before the priest gathered their trumpets, before the people prepared to come against Jericho, before they prepared for war, before they prepared for victory, there had to be a cutting away. There had to be a removal of the flesh. And Joshua chapter 5, verse 2, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives, praise the Lord, And circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness, by the way. That was a, the, the other generation, the generation of the past. Now we're in today. After they came out of Egypt, after they came out of the world, after they came out of carnality. In chapter verse 5, now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not cir- circumcised, of course. And then verse 7, and their children whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they all were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. And in verse 8, and it came to pass that when they had done circumcising all the people, and they were all prepared, and they abode in the places in their camp until they were made whole. God's going to do a work in us, church. He's going to put a work in us where there's some flesh that we're not aware of that that has just lingered and maybe just we didn't notice it. 
We didn't know it through our walk with God, but he knows about it, and he knows how to get it, get it, get it right. But he's going to consecrate this church and prepare us for an, in, for an influx, for a mighty revival. But there's some things that we got to get out of the way. But he's not going to do it without giving you a chance to heal. Because when God starts pulling flesh away, it hurts. There's going to be a time where you don't understand why. I feel the Holy Ghost. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt, the world, from of you, from off you. Wherefore, the name of this place called Gilgal unto this day. I am so thankful that God has sent the man of God to lead this church in this hour to pull away the reproach of a world that has contaminated my heart. You cannot remain an observer and remain in the process. You can't just sit here and watch. You can't do it. Church is going to go off and leave you. You have to stay in the process. Nor can you exchange worldly or a fleshly process for God's word. He stirred me on this one. There's a lot of people want to want to fall on, you know, step out of the process. Oh, it's easy. I can just do a, I can just do my own program. I can just make I can make my own curriculum. I can it make it's easier. They'll they'll understand it easier. They'll understand it faster and then we'll it will gradually get to where we're going to go. That's not God's work. God wants to remove that flesh. Get rid of it. Now let's look at the process a little differently. In the beginning of the process, there has to be a source. We're talking about the influx, the source. And they must be drawn by the Spirit. And they're going to need remission of sins. They're going to have to be washed with water. But, you know, this is the struggle because this is where a lot of churches stop because they don't want to leave this experience. How many people stayed behind when Jesus ascended into heaven and left behind? There was only 120 that actually showed up at the upper room. There was 500 that watched him leave, that descend into heaven. What happened to those? They stayed in that experience. But there's so many people that stay in this experience because this is their first experience, and they don't want to see anything else. They don't think there's anything else left to, to get from it. But wait until the pressure arrives. Sister Jackson, you you experienced some pressure. And you see where God's taken you to a higher place. You see that, Sister Hannah. God's got a higher place for you, no matter what you're going through. Brother J.R., what you're going through wasn't, wasn't by accident. God wants to take you closer. He wants to take you further. He wants to take you deeper. The separation of the flesh and the carnality, and it sometimes just boils down to our own will, what, what we want. God is trying to prepare us to be used in God's kingdom and in his timing so that we can be a useful vessel in his kingdom. A vessel of honor, a useful vessel, but we struggle with that. And something that I didn't uh, didn't mention too much in the other process is there's a, there's a part of the process where they have to there's there's different vessels that's used that it contains an absorbent that is used to absorb different components in water and different things because you have to have a dry system. 
And that, that component is a, is a catalyst. It actually holds on to the molecular structure. It's down to the very molecular sizes. And what you have to do is you have to regenerate those beds. They're actually called absorber beds. And um, the way you do that, it's really interesting. You take clean gas, you heat it up, and you recycle it backwards through those vessels so that it will heat up the beds and remove all of those components and vent it out and just get it completely out of the system so that you can reuse and regenerate. We actually call it regenerate. Just regenerate the beds. So your understanding is like, why did God call me to a spirit of intercession? Because he trusted you, Sister Hildebrand, that you were pure enough to be recycled to go back and take your team and refresh and rebuild the beds so that the others can benefit, so that we can all be regenerated, so that we can all walk in, in a pureness and a cleanness The process of circumcision, the removing of flesh, the carnality, and our own will. And you're going to be tested. He's going, he's going to verify how pure you are. So you're going to be tested. And it just, you know what the indicator is? We have indicators. When you're in a plant, you have at least three indicators. You have a flow indicator, or a pressure indicator, or a temperature indicator. That's it. We have responses because that's an outward show of what, you're, what condition you're in. And how you respond to the spirit and how you respond to the circumcision and the removing of that flesh is what's going to show on the outside of you. And being tempted, and don't, don't shy away from the testing, the testing is what's important because that's the important part of the separation. The pressure's real. It's a real experience. You're going to go through some things that you're going to sit in your room and you're going to say, why, on the Lord? why, Lord? Why are you making me go through this? Because he has a purpose for you, a higher purpose for you. But then there's the enemy. Then there's going to be, you're going to be tempted because ultimately you have a choice how you're going to respond. But the enemy, the adversary, as we so like, well, what do you call him, Sister Hildebrand? Stinking devil. I love it when she calls him names. That's so funny. The adversary is trying to get you to remove yourself from the process. If you can just get offended. He's got you. Get your feelings hurt? I'm out of here. The enemy will speak little lies. Those that are just 90% truth and 10% lie into your thought process so he can distract you. If the deceiver can get you to look at the flesh and get your eyes off Christ... That's what his purpose is. And uh, I want to share some of the thoughts that came to my mind because this is what the devil was telling me. That's not what you were taught. How many of you fighting with spirits that are coming and trying to speak in your mind right now? I don't understand all this. I don't know why he's talking about this. You'll have these little thoughts, and you're thinking, you think it's your own thoughts. You think it's your own ability to consider, and you're, you're not realizing that the devil's still trying to whisper in your ear. And this is the one that scares me to death. Well, I believe, you know, it's dangerous, because that could be probably the most blasphemous words we could ever utter out of our mouth if we're not careful. Because if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, we ain't got no business saying, I believe. And if you can just put a thought into your mind and you can allow yourself to utter just, just a couple of words out of your mouth, 
Just speak. In Job chapter 2, verse 10, you don't have to turn there, but he talks about it. He didn't sin with his lips. And the, ooh. There's a lot of people that struggle with the separation in the process, and they just blow it. They get kicked completely out of the process because they can't keep their mouth shut. Who does he think he is? He is just a man like me. You let that thought go through your head. You better just bang your head against the wall. God, get that thought out of my head. I know it's the devil. I'm going to tell you something. This is the man of God. This is the apostle. Oh, and here's, here's one I used to wrestle with years ago. I don't do it anymore. It's my tithes and my offerings. No, it ain't. It's God's tithes, God's offering. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have a stinking dime. I've already heard this message preached before years ago. He just... You can tune out. The devil wants you to tune out. He just check you out. He's like, oh, I can start thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow at work and what I'm going to need to do when I get home. He wants you to check out. And, you know, here's one of the, one of the really difficult ones I know. Is, uh, there's nobody here that does this, okay? Well, I know brother so-and-so, and he ain't perfect. such a crazy way to justify our own flesh. The choices are yours to make. Stay in the process. Even though you have a mature mind, and uh, you're mature beyond most carnal sin. I misread my own notes. So what happens when I go from type to writing? I can't read my own writing. But still the flesh needs to be removed. And it really just really kind of struck me odd because I remember the words that Jesus spoke in the garden in Matthew 26 and 41 and 42. If you can get it on the screen, I'd, okay. Jesus is in the garden. He says, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. You remember you talking about that flesh that he got from Mary? He's still fighting it. And Jesus put it to rest because he said, thy will be done. Because he had a choice. Now, I want to just give you my own personality, person, a personal testimony. I didn't realize there were voices in my mind. I thought it was my wisdom and my intellect. And I had uh, spoke a thought that just sit in my spirit. And when the right pressure was applied or the situation that conflicted with my way of thinking... That's the only time it revealed itself. I am very honored to know that 
I am just a few days older, younger than you, Brother Jackson. My, my birthday is just around the corner. Praise the Lord. But there's something that really struck me. Brother Massey, you spoke about something. You spoke about seeing a vision of a large dead tree that had grown in someone's front yard in their home, and you were doing everything you could to cut that dead tree down. Now, I'm from East Texas, where if you have a dead tree in your yard, you're in grave danger because the tree, you cannot wrap your arms around it, and it's over 80 feet tall, 60 feet tall. Here in San Antonio, there's not really big trees. We, we call those bushes in East Texas. Y'all call them mesquite trees. Uh-uh. But that's, that's the, the, my mind went straight to that big, long-needled pine. And uh, we have a thing down there in East Texas called the pine beetle, and it will kill a mighty pine tree in uh, just a short amount of time. And it just resonated with me, Brother, Brother Massey. In my 58 years of being in this truth, I have sat under and I was influenced by over eight men of God. I had to sit down and count. I was like, okay. When I was all the pastors, all the men of God that would have been in my life, mighty men of God, some of them just eh, prophets in their own right. But God talked to me. He says, those were men in your, in your past. Those were trees in your past. You leaned on those in your past. But today, you have to be submitted to my man of God for this time, for this, this purpose. I have to stay in the process. I can't wrestle with what I learned, Lord, 50 years ago. I struggled. I genuinely struggled with things like this. And and, and I, I would, I, I'd go back to those old voices or the voices of old, if you want to say it a little nicer. They're speaking to me in this stage of my process. I had to choose who I was going to listen to. If you have a question or you need an answer from God, the answer is, 99 chances out of 100 are going to come from this pulpit right here. And it's your responsibility as a child of God to be in this house on those pews. And, and what I noticed is when I was going through my time, my trial, my darkness, my bit of pressure, I sat on the edge of my chair because I needed an answer. Because I had, I had, some, I had made a choice. I ain't leaving the process. I ain't doing it. My, my son and I have a little joke between us. We're Johnstons. We don't quit. He, <laughs> when, he's in, when he's in high school, he hated it. He's like, no, I wouldn't let him quit. If he committed to something, he had to stick with it. That's why he has a hard time quitting things. He can't let go. It's all right, son. God's given you a word. That's all you got to lean on. I'm asking you to make the right choice today. Stay in the process. Sister, whoever's playing, I'm going to start closing. No. This church body still needs to go a little further, a little deeper in God, which is going to require more submission and a little bit more cutting away. Because we have said to God many times, use me, Lord, no matter what it takes. 
Now, anybody here regretting saying you wanted to be used by the kingdom? You did earlier. Y'all were real happy and clapping your hands. When we pray that prayer, when we sing those songs, God takes us at our word. He's not calling us a liar. He's taking us, that's what we, we were saying it, we're going to mean it. And that song, <laughs> I mean, I, I really would sing it a lot. And uh, the sad thing is, the gentleman that wrote that song is a long way out of the process. Here's the words. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree. And he whispers, draw closer to me. Leave this world far behind. There are new heights to climb and a new place in me you will find. And whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'd be willing to do. And whatever it takes to be more like you, that's what I'm willing to do. Take my houses and my lands. Take my dreams and my plans. A place, my whole life in your hands. And if you call me someday to a land far away, Lord, I'll go. And you, I will obey. And whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. And whatever it takes for my will to break, that's what I'll be willing to do. Can we play that? How many of you want to sing that? How many of you can sing it with a prayer? There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree, and he whispers, draw closer to me. Leave this world far behind. There are new heights to climb. And a new place in me you will find. And whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll be willing. sing and whatever it takes to draw closer to you Lord that's what I'll be willing to do open up your hearts tonight and Sing that song as a prayer. God is here today. He's here right now. He wants to fix the broken pieces. He wants to pull you out of that darkness, that place where your flesh is fighting you. No matter what you're going through, you may not understand why, but stay in the process. If you have a need, you can come to the front tonight. And give it to him. Put it as his feet. Place it in his hands. And so, Lord,
Take my heart. Take my soul. Lord, do what you need to do with me, Lord. Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. 